Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Can you imagine hosting a garden party where the primary source of illumination is not fairy lights or lanterns, but human beings set ablaze? That's exactly what Emperor Nero did according to historical accounts. Nero isn't just another Roman ruler. He's an embodiment of the potential for human cruelty and the dangers of unchecked power. Understanding his actions doesn't just add a chapter to Roman history. It also serves as a horrifying mirror reflecting the darker corners of human nature. Stick around as we delve deeper into the disturbing world of Nero's reign. When Nero became emperor at just 17 years old, Rome was in a state of chaos. The empire was huge, but it was also filled with internal conflicts and power struggles among the top leaders. These leaders would later turn out to be some of Nero's biggest critics. Nero's rise to power wasn't just a tale of royal privilege and destiny fulfilled. It was also a psychological evolution of a man whose darker impulses magnified as he gained more power. Born into a family well connected to the Roman aristocracy, Nero grew up in an environment where he had access to education and a wide array of artistic pursuits. As a young boy, his love for music, acting, and poetry was evident. However, this artistic sensitivity seemed to coexist with a growing taste for extreme indulgences and acts of cruelty. During his childhood and adolescent years, there were signs of his burgeoning darker tendencies. Minor cruelties, often inflicted on household slaves or animals, served as a precursor to the more chilling acts he would later commit. Reports suggest that even as a child, he relished his authority over slaves and servants, often inflicting petty cruelties on them as a form of amusement. As Nero entered adolescence, his behaviors took on more manipulative and emotionally abusive forms. While he was lauded for his intelligence and artistic abilities, he was also known for using his wit and charm to manipulate others into doing his bidding something he often practiced among his close acquaintances and tutors. One of the best-known tutors who felt Nero's manipulative tendencies was Seneca, his advisor. Seneca would later be forced into committing suicide due to his connections with Nero. In an environment that was already cutthroat and amoral, where political assassination and backstabbing were par for the course, the young Nero seemed to regard his increasing moral transgressions as stepping stones to power. During this time, his mother, Agrippina the Younger, maneuverer behind the scenes to eliminate rivals and secure Nero's position as the next in line for the throne, further amplifying his belief that cruelty and manipulation were viable means to secure power. When he assumed the throne at 17, surrounded by sycophants and yes-men, Nero was suddenly handed an unprecedented level of power and influence. The young emperor was easily swayed by the last voice he heard and those voices often whispered encouragements for his darker impulses. The turning point came early in his reign with the execution of his mother, Agrippina. This wasn't a spontaneous act but a calculated move that had layers of motivations behind it. His mother had been a forceful presence, possibly constraining Nero's own grip on power. Her death not only shocked Roman society but sent a clear message. Nero would stop at nothing to secure his position and eliminate threats, even if that meant matricide. The death of his mother served as a psychological and ethical point of no return for Nero. The very act of killing someone so close, both in terms of blood and influence, seemed to eliminate any remaining barriers to his capacity for cruelty. It opened the floodgates for a regime characterized by ruthless suppression of dissent, sadistic forms of entertainment, and a level of self-indulgence that was extravagant even by Roman standards. And this leads us to one of the most horrifying chapters in Nero's reign, his infamous bloody banquets. Imagine you're invited to what is touted as an extravagant event, hosted in a garden of unparalleled beauty, complete with sculptures and fountains. But as night falls, you realize that the place is illuminated not by lamps or candles but by living human beings set on fire. These were Nero's twisted spectacles, a dreadful form of art, that combined his love for grandiosity with his cruel instincts. The victims of these macabre garden parties were often Christians. Nero had accused them of starting the Great Fire of Rome, a fire that many suspected he himself had ignited to make way for his palace. In a sick twist of irony, these innocent people were doused in flammable oils and set ablaze, serving as living, burning torches for his gatherings. 
It was a spectacle that perfectly illustrated Nero's sadistic tendencies. After these blood-chilling banquets, the people of Rome were left in a state of shock and awe. It was the talk of the city, a terrifying blend of fear and fascination. Rumors spread like wildfire through the Roman populace, with some speculating that Nero's sadism had reached new levels of madness. For a society already numbed by the brutalities of the Colosseum and other public spectacles, this new form of entertainment was beyond comprehension. Many people, especially among the educated and aristocratic classes, started distancing themselves from the emperor, their former praise turning into hushed whispers of condemnation. The public sentiment was one of increasing unease. The general populace began to see Nero not just as a ruler, but as a personification of evil, a man who could defy the basic norms of human decency for his own amusement. But it wasn't just ordinary citizens who were horrified. The Senate and the Roman elite, who had already been wary of Nero's erratic behavior, found this new level of cruelty a stark violation of Rome's ethical and civic codes. Nero's earlier actions had been horrifying but somewhat in line with the political brutalities of the time. Now, however, he had entered a realm of sadism that not even his most hardened critics could have imagined. The impact of these events created rifts even among Nero's closest advisors. Figures like Burrus, who had been instrumental in maintaining Nero's grip on power, were either sidelined or met tragic ends, like forced suicides or mysterious deaths. Those who survived became increasingly unwilling to challenge Nero, their fear outweighing any remaining loyalty or sense of duty. These events ultimately played a significant role in Nero's downfall. Already, he was facing military challenges on the frontiers and conspiracies within the Senate. The banquets only intensified the urgency among his critics to remove him from power. Conspiracies against Nero became more frequent, and with a ruler so universally feared and despised, it wasn't difficult to find those willing to participate. Nero's death was a tragic culmination of the very chaos and turmoil he had inflicted upon others. In 68 AD, Nero found himself utterly isolated. The Roman Senate had declared him an enemy of the state, and his inner circle had dissipated, some abandoning him to align with his enemies, others having been executed or forced into suicide. With armies revolting and Galba, the governor of Hispania, declaring himself the rightful ruler, Nero's downfall became apparent. Having lost all support and with enemies closing in, Nero attempted to flee Rome with a handful of loyalists. Realizing that he could not escape, he returned to his villa on the outskirts of Rome. It was there that Nero grappled with the idea of suicide, perhaps one final act that he could control in a life that had spiraled into chaos. According to historical accounts, he hesitated, vacillating between moments of fear and regret. It's said that he tried to enlist the aid of a few remaining companions to end his life for him, but even in these desperate moments, they were too afraid to act. Finally, with the sounds of horsemen approaching, soldiers sent to capture him, Nero seized a dagger and drove it into his throat. However, even in this act, he lacked the resolve to finish it decisively. It was one of his few remaining loyal companions, named Epaphroditus, who had to press the dagger deeper to complete the act. Nero's final words, what an artist dies in me, rang as an eerie echo of a man torn between his artistic pursuits and the horrors he had unleashed upon his own people. Whether those words were a moment of delusion or a lament, they encapsulate the complexities of a man who, despite his talents, allowed his darker impulses to overshadow any virtues he might have had. His body was buried modestly by a few remaining loyal female servants, in stark contrast to the grandeur and ostentation he had sought all his life. The man who once illuminated his banquets with human lives was himself extinguished, left to be a dark footnote in the annals of Roman history. The world he left behind was one relieved to be rid of him, yet forever scarred by his reign. It was a legacy of caution for generations to come, an enduring lesson in the dangers of power unchecked and humanity unbounded. Thank you for joining me on this dark journey into the life of Nero. If you found this story both fascinating and horrifying, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell for more historical deep dives. Stay curious, and stay vigilant.